very much for that introduction. Um, I just want to give, in 20 minutes, a very brief overview of the New Forest Roman pottery industry, um, which I, as, as Frank said, I, I worked on for my PhD um, many years ago now. Um, but the story really does begin with Hayward Sumner, who, um, he wasn't the first to work in the New Forest. Others had been there in the 19th century, um, discovering um, the first evidence of Roman pottery manufacture there. But Hayward Summer was the first to do systematic work um, and to publish it pretty promptly. And 100 years ago, he began that with a site in the north at Ashley Rails. And uh, together, he published the work he did on the, on the, in the forest, on the various kiln sites, um, in 1927, in, the, in his classic book of, on the New Forest Roman pottery industry. Um, so that's a view of his, one of his illustrations. He was a, a arts and craft a painter, he, uh, stained glass windows and churches. He did a lot uh, in terms of the decoration of churches which were constructed around the turn of the 19th and 20th century. Um, and he turned his hand to archaeology. Um, for sale out there is his um, book on the earthworks of Cranbourne Chase, which was also published 100 years ago in 1917. Um, but his work on the New Forest pottery, um, he started quite late on, um, after he'd, his main, if you like, uh, professional work had finished um, when he was in his 60s. So Ashley Rails, um, and these beautiful illustrations, location maps of, of, of where the, the, the actual sites down here near Ashley Lodge. Um, and this, uh, his work at, at Linwood, uh, showing actually one of the kiln structures, very simple structure and the, and the workman. These are absolutely classic uh, Hayward Sumner illustrations. And then his reconstruction of how um, one of the kilns might have worked. So um, the um, stoke hole down here, the fire, and then the pots stacked up and then sort of covered with uh, a dome of earth and turf and, 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 and so on. <laughs> so he brought the New Forest Pottery to national and indeed international attention through his 1927 publication. And that work got into the secondary literature about Roman Britain quite early on. So when Collingwood wrote his classic on Roman Britain in the mid-1930s, um, he was able to draw on Hayward Summers' work uh, then. Um, those at the back, I won't have a chance to see, but I, this slide shows roughly the distribution of the main known kiln sites um, in the New Forest. So um, up, up here are the, the, the Ashley Rails, Pittswood, where Hayward Sumner worked, Islands Thorns, where some of the early 19th century discoveries were made and collections passed um, in particular to the British Museum. Um, and then uh, Crock Hill, uh, so named because of the mound of, of wasters associated with the production of pottery there, Crock Hill, an amberwood enclosure where I excavated some years ago, uh, Sloan enclosure to the south. So little discrete groups. Um, we know nothing about ownership, who owned the forest at this time. Was it all part of a single estate with different groups of potters working? Lots of questions about how this industry evolved and how it operated remain, remain to be addressed. Um, kilns. Um, uh, simple clay-fired structures, horizontal floor supported on, 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 on pedestals around the edge of the kiln. So here, one of the amberwood kilns, um, and then the pots stacked. Um, so there is a, a view of the floor, so the curve of the kiln, the apertures through which the gases rose and circulated amongst the pots, um, and this is basically a fired clay floor constructed in a, a sort of basic sort of wattle matrix. Um, so this was a kiln that was just making uh, domestic wares, kitchen wares, the Roman grey wares, in the late third, fourth century. Um, and the next kiln uh, illustrating a very simple structure, just sort of elongated, slightly rounded at one end, um, probably one of the latest kilns from the forest, so later fourth century, simple structure, and that, like so many of the kilns of the forest, was making both the kitchen greywares, but also 
the, um, the types of pottery which gave the New Forest its, its reputation that, that Hayward Sumner um, uh, 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 published initially in, in 1927. So making color-coded wares, so wares with slips on, um, both oxidized oranges and reds, and the reduced um, grays and blacks um, of a range of drinking vessels and um, containers. So the overall um, production, um, just to give you an idea of the sorts of, so here we have um, flagons and flasks with their distinctive um, spouts, the distinctive thumb pot. Now, um, Richard, can I ask you to, I have an example of a New Forest thumb pot, but probably the most celebrated product of the New Forest, in a, to quickly pass around, but I hope it won't drop. Um, <laughs> it is, but Richard, just, just to say, so people actually can see what a New Forest indented beaker looks like. Um, but I want to, I've got to leave shortly after 12 o'clock, so um, hopefully I'll be able to recover it. There is, um, in anticipation, here is one of those thumb pots illustrated here. Um, so drinking vessels of various sorts, and then these um, red color-coated bowls, some of them with impressed decoration that you see here, rosette stamps. And this, this industry, how it originates its traditions, some of them you can relate to empire-wide traditions, the tradition of stamping the vessels um, as opposed to the mold-made um, decorated samian of the first and second centuries. That tradition you can find right across the Roman Empire through the 4th, 5th, 6th, and indeed into the 7th <coughs> century AD. So there's something that connects New Forest internationally, but there's also within the forest traditions which develop in terms of the styles, the shapes, and the decoration, which is very distinctive and uniquely New Forest. And that includes some of the choices of stamp decoration, but also the way in which some of the wares were, were painted um, and some of the fabrics that were chosen. Um, so here are two vessels which are in the British Museum collection. Um, both of them have this white painted, so groups of three. And that's actually a repetitive motif of some of this um, painted pottery. So white paint on a reduced um, dark or sort of bluish black slip. Um, and here, this flask, um, you've got this kind of lattice decoration and little now that's very distinctive New Forest and variations of that on different forms can be found quite widely where the wares were distributed in southern England. And you won't find it, on, as far as I'm aware, on any other industry, certainly not in Britain, and I've not seen it in the continent. So as the industry developed, so local traditions, distinctive traditions evolve with it. So those are a couple of the fine ware vessels. Here is something which is unusual which is um, decoration of um, a stag um, in barbotine. That's to say the clay is in relief. It's um, the, the liquid clay which is applied to the outside of the vessel, which is a, another beaker. Um, now that tradition of, 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 of stags and uh, deer chasing around vessels, that you can tr tr trace back to the um, second century, certainly. But this vessel is late third or fourth century. So a little bit of that work, but that's um, quite rare. Um, this collection of vessels from uh, Wessex Archaeology's excavations at Boscombe Down, just uh, near um, Amesbury in Wiltshire, um, these mostly from, from burials, gives you some idea of the range of vessels that are being, in this case, uh, used as grave goods. Um, so here you've got more examples of the thumb pots here, and here, and here. Here's a, a, a cup with a, a pedestal. Um, with, so that, that's almost certainly imitating um, uh, probably a metal vessel with a, a pedestal, like a, a goblet, um, white painted decoration. Um, and that's a, a, a fairly typical array of the vessels that you might expect to find when uh, you go beyond about 30 miles or so from the uh, production centers in the forest. It's the finer wares which, which travel, travel furthest. Um, and another uh, collection from uh, Wessex Archaeology Excavations at the Langhill Cemetery in Winchester. Again, a similar array. Um, so again, favoring the indented thumb pot beaker that's, that's the type that's being passed around. So 
examples here and here, um, but also other flagons here and these uh, slightly rarer ones with basic white, um, sometimes called parchment ware fabric. Um, again, these are uh, fourth century in date. And that's the, the first half of the fourth century is when the industry has its um, greatest um, uh, uh, impact extent of, of trade um, in the Roman period. It probably starts sometime in the third century, but then really takes off in, in the last sort of quarter of the third century and the first half of the fourth century. This is one of these distinctive um, uh, examples of uh, these, these pale fabrics, so-called parchment wear. Um, uh, on the left, you can see the brown paint which has been applied to the white fabric. And this is an example of, of a candlestick. And that's one of the distinctive New Forest products, so these um, uh, candlesticks of, 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 of late Roman date. And next to it is a rim, again, of a form um, which is almost exclusive to the New Forest of, of bowls, again, with this wavy brown painted decoration on the plain white background, but with this internal um, rim edge around it. Um, and these, again, these parchment ware bowls have quite a wide distribution in, in southern England. This um, map is taken from uh, Paul Tyers' website, the Potshard website, to just to give you an overall impression of the distribution of uh, the new forest wares um, in the late 3rd, 4th century. Um, and you see the distribution really clusters in central southern England, so Hampshire, Dorset, Wiltshire, Sussex, West Sussex. But these more remote finds um, extending into Gloucestershire, South Wales. Um, and indeed, there is an example from uh, Carlisle and here uh, from uh, Caister by Yarmouth on the Norfolk coast. There are these distant examples of these beakers, um, some of which with this distinctive white painted decoration on the reduced um, uh, bluish black, blackish background. But this is the, the core of it. Um, that's that's Carnarvon. In fact, actually, there's a, another example from um, a, a late uh, Iron Age Roman farmstead on Anglesey at, at Den Higley. Um, so this is not 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 captured everything. Um, and of course, there's also some New Forest pottery across the Channel in Brittany um, and in um, uh, Normandy. Uh, if just sort of focusing onto uh, southern England. This, this map takes account of everything that can be identified as new forest. So both the, the tablewares, the beakers and the flasks um, and, and tableware bowls and the, the cooking wares, really just to emphasize that the area where you're most likely to find new forest pottery in the late third or fourth century is quite a limited area. Um, so S is, is Soria doing is Salisbury. So it's a distribution that sort of includes uh, Winchester um, sites, so the west of the forest. Um, you're still getting some of the grey wares at, at Porchester Castle, at the head of Portsmouth Harbour, and small amounts at Chichester. But when you get beyond that core area, you don't find those cooking wares, even though some of those, those wares, again, have a very distinctive idiosyncratic uh, characteristics which make them a very attractive vessels. Um, you don't find them. It's only you know, small amounts of the predominantly the beakers, predominantly the thumb pots, which are found um, uh, further afield. So that's um, up in Bath, at Sirencester up here. Um, just a few examples from London. Of course, the Isle of Wight has has uh, examples, and then fine wares in Brittany and, and Normandy. Uh, an example, there's stuff from Pevensey Castle, also from, from Richborough, uh, Saxon Shawfort. So um, that's the history. What, one of the, um, the, the challenges which I had um, when I was doing my PhD was being able to distinguish new forest um, 
cooking and grey wares from those produced in the Alice Holt forest in the Roman period. And that sort of question I don't think yet has been satisfactorily resolved. So as you get further east and you see the two traditions, as it were, merging in a collection of Roman pottery, it's quite hard to be confident that is Alice Holt, this is from the New Forest. But as I say, there are those distinctive types of bowls and storage jars, which you can uh, obviously pin down to the New Forest. So there are questions about the relationship with other industries. And it's interesting too that just down the road, really, at Pool Harbour, there was this other great uh, Roman pottery industry which produced the uh, distinctive black burnished pottery, which has a provincial wide distribution. So that was there, it was there and established before the new forest got going. But what that industry didn't do was to make the tableware types, which the new forest did. So that um, gives you a brief overview. I hope some of you are managing to see the new forest pot that's buzzing around. Um, and I think for further information, you couldn't do no better than <laughs> consult <laughs> this, the reprint of 2000, which I suspect is still probably available. Anyway, Amazon would get it for you. So thank you very much. Thank you.